What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. We are back today with a very, very wild episode for you on an individual who's been called by some the most evil mother in America. We're covering the case of Shelly Notek. I mean, I love her dearly, and she there's no way that she caused any abuse on Ron or Kathy or anything. And Within a year, she had gone from a rude, uncontrollable little kid to a sadistic teenager. And her daughters were vocal about how they feared for the safety of others if their mother was ever released. Dave would later say that this was not just the happiest moment, but the only happy moment in his entire marriage. Shelly even named one of her favorite forms of torture. If she ever turns up on my doorstep, I can just see myself locking all my doors and barricading myself in the bathroom. Light out, everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. I am your host, Josh. I'm joined in the studio by my co-host, Austin. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going? doing well and our producer daniel what's up man how's it going everybody we are back today with a very very wild episode for you on an individual who's been called by some the most evil mother in america we're covering the case of shelly no tech and this one is a very disturbing case for sure and it'll be interesting to see how you feel at the end of it there's a lot of things to cover so we're not going to waste any time today here in the intro, and we're just going to jump right into Shelly Notick, also known as the serial killer mom. So Shelly Notick was born Michelle Watson, and obviously she went by Shelly. And she was born in Raymond, Washington and on April 15, 1954. She did have two younger brothers named Chuck and Paul. Her parents were Lester and Sharon Watson, which Lester, he went by less, and that's how we'll be referring to him in this case, but Sharon was an alcoholic and a suspected sex worker who often neglected her children. Supposedly, she also welcomed many abusive boyfriends into their home after Shelly's parents separated. By the time Shelly was six years old, she and her younger brother Chuck went to live with their father, Les, and new stepmother, Laura Stallings, in Battleground, Washington. Shelly never had contact with her birth mother ever again. Sharon went to live with a man in Skid Row, Los Angeles. And Shelly's younger brother, Paul, ended up living with Sharon. While in their new living situation, Shelly and Chuck's new stepmother, Laura, took it upon herself to raise the children. She didn't even know that Les had children with another woman until they came to live with him. But she tried to raise them the best that she could. Unfortunately, Shelly would quickly become, quote unquote, the stepdaughter from hell. She told Laura every day how much she hated her, and she would kick and scream until she got her way. She would also constantly make up lies and accuse family members of stealing from her. While Laura tried controlling her stepdaughter's behavior, Les let Shelly get away with everything. And even at school, teachers really struggled to deal with Shelly. Like most troubled children, her grades were awful, and she despised any authority figure in her life. At home, Shelly also had a strange control over her brother Chuck. When they first moved in, Chuck refused to speak, and Shelly would speak for him, and tell him what to do. Coming from a vulnerable and unstable living situation, Chuck saw Shelly as the only person he could trust, so he listened to her every command. Meanwhile, Les mostly ignored the situation, and Laura was left at home to try and figure everything out with the kids on a day to day basis. Things only got worse with Shelly's paternal grandmother, Anna. Every time Laura tried to correct Shelly's behavior, Anna would interrupt and proceed to enable it. Anna quickly took on the role of the matriarch of the family and let Shelly do whatever she wanted. Anna and her husband George owned several nursing homes in the area and most of her employees hated her. Most were younger women and Anna was known for physically and emotionally abusing them if they ever stepped out of line. Supposedly there were reports of shoving her employees heads into toilets and also getting them to wash her feet. And at home it really wasn't much different. She even forced her husband George to sleep in the backyard shed for 20 years of their marriage. Can you believe that? Most people she came across, she found a way to abuse them. But for whatever reason, Shelly was the only person who could avoid her grandmother's wrath. 
In a strange sort of way, Anna took Shelley under her wing. She became her granddaughter's role model and taught her how to treat people terribly and then proceed to get away with it. By the time Shelley was 13, news came that her birth mother, Sharon, had been murdered. She had been in a relationship with a violently abusive man and allegedly he had beaten her to death in a motel room. When Shelley heard the news, she didn't show any obvious signs of grief. However, her family noticed that her behavior got even worse than usual. Within a year, she had gone from a rude, uncontrollable little kid to a sadistic teenager. Her youngest brother, Paul, had been living with their birth mother, but now he had come to live with the rest of them. And from the moment Paul came home, Shelley started putting sharp pieces of glass inside her brother's shoes, then waited to enjoy his pain and agony. Other times she took it out on Laura. She knew that Laura prided herself on a nice clean home, so she would destroy things, and once she even tried to light the house on fire. If the physical destruction wasn't enough, she would go around spreading rumors that her stepmom was abusing and neglecting her, and by the time she was 15 years old, she would start spreading her biggest lie yet. So one day while meeting with a school counselor, she accused her father of raping her. And as far as we know, this was a lie, but the school took the accusation seriously. They opened up an investigation and sent Shelley to a medical clinic. The medical evaluation showed that Shelley had no signs of physical or sexual assault. That same evening, Laura went into Shelley's room to try and find evidence of the accusations being true. She couldn't understand why she would make this accusation out of the blue, but she found a true confession magazine between Shelley's mattress and bed frame. And guess what was on the cover of that magazine? The words, I was raped at 15 by my father. It was obvious that Shelley took the idea from the magazine and then used it to try and hurt her own father. After she was examined by the clinic, she was released on the condition that she would be taken to a psychologist. Supposedly, she had several therapy sessions, but she claimed they never helped. When the school administration discovered that Shelley was lying, they suspended her for it. She later ended up living with Laura's parents as well. Unsurprisingly, she caused trouble there. They tried to give her chores, like clearing the dishes after dinner, but Shelley would just throw the dishes in the garbage. And they also struggled with disciplining her. But they thought they finally saw a change in Shelly when she told them she wanted to babysit the neighbor's kids. They're like, oh, okay, that's a nice thing to do. They saw this as a sign that maybe Shelly wanted some more responsibility and she wanted to change and prove herself and she was maturing. But Shelly really only wanted to babysit these children because she knew that she could control and abuse the younger neighborhood kids. While the adults were out of the house, she would barricade the kids in their rooms and put furniture outside their door so they couldn't escape. Then she would just go sit on the couch and relax. Before the parents got home, she would move the furniture and let the kids go free. Back at her step-parents' house, she caused more trouble by lying and accusing her own step-grandfather of sexually abusing her. And it got to the point where her step-grandfather kicked her out of the house. Later, she lived in St. Mary the Valley boarding school run by nuns in Beaverton, Oregon for a short while. But she was caught putting broken glass in her schoolmates' shoes and destroying their homework. The other girls also noticed Shelly would wake up screaming in the middle of the night. The nuns eventually removed her from the boarding school after only one year of attendance. She then moved in with Laura's sister and brother-in-law, Katie and Frank. And again, she caused more problems. Supposedly, she soon contributed to the couple's divorce, and she had to move back in with Les and Laura. In February 1973, when she was just 18 years old, she finally moved out of the house, and she would struggle to hold on to one job for too long. She had dreams of becoming a nurse, but never followed through. Instead, she took up work in her family's nursing homes, and she found a passion for helping the elderly. It gave her some stability in life, and she would need that stability because the next decade of her life was filled with toxic relationships and more failed marriages. Her first husband was an old classmate from high school, Randy Rivardo, and she married him when she was just 19 years old. The marriage was rushed under pressure from her father, Les, Les had met Randy through the family business of nursing homes, and Les wanted to get his daughter off his hands. In his eyes, once he married her off, she'd be the other man's problem. Randy ended up making all the money between the two, and on top of that, he did all the chores in the relationship, and if Randy ever got on her nerves, which was often, she would just lock him out of the house for the night, just like her grandmother had done with her husband, George. Randy would end up sleeping in his car for many nights during their marriage, Soon, Shelley demanded all of his money and controlled the family's finances. 
When Randy tried to protest, Shelly called her father, Les, who was Randy's boss, and demanded that he give Randy's paychecks directly to her. Les agreed. On top of this, Les would also give Shelly an allowance, would buy her clothes, and even bought her a new car. But it wasn't the exact car that she wanted, and when she didn't get her way, she found a way to start drama. She threw such a fit over the car that she lied about taking too many pills. So they rushed her to the hospital, and she had to have her stomach pumped. But all they found was two aspirin. Then she asked her dad to buy her a new house, but he denied her. So she tried to convince her dad that her current house wasn't safe. So to do this, she staged a break-in. To convince Les that the neighborhood wasn't safe, she physically beat herself and cut herself to make it look like the person who broke in also assaulted her. Her lying eventually paid off, and Les, in fact, bought her a new house. By now, Shelly realized she had the special gift of manipulation and she could almost always get her way depending on who she was manipulating. By 1974, Shelly had gotten pregnant. In February 1975, she gave birth to her first daughter, named Nikki. When Nikki was born, some of her family members thought this might be the change that Shelly needed to better herself finally. But that quickly changed when she divorced Randy and handed off her daughter to Laura. She then fled north to Vancouver and found work as a waitress. Later that year, Shelly finally returned and picked up her daughter like nothing had happened. She then began dating a man named Danny Long, and she married him in June of 1978. They ended up moving into a house that her grandma Anna had left her, and she gave birth to a second daughter named Samantha, who they nicknamed Sammy, in August of 1978. But this marriage wasn't much different than her last. Shelly was verbally and physically abusive to Danny, and after five years, they divorced in 1983. At 29 years old, she met her third and final husband, Dave Notek, at a local pub. So Dave was a veteran of the Vietnam War and was working as a carpenter at the time. Almost immediately, he fell deeply in love with Shelly, and she knew exactly how to charm him. Dave had recently gone through a rough breakup, and Shelly had filled that void. She knew how to make him feel like the most special guy in the entire world, and like always... Once he was in her clutches, she took advantage of him. At some point early in their relationship, Shelly convinced Dave that she had cancer and didn't have long to live. She was also worried about who would care for her kids after she was gone, so this was a way to guilt trip Dave into marrying her. He now felt like he had a responsibility to help the family, and they married soon after. And this marriage would become a decades-long string of abuse and murder. And around that same time when they married, Nikki had one of her earliest memories of abuse. One night she woke up unable to breathe. There was a pillow that had been pressed over her face. In a panic, she tried calling out to her mother, but as the pillow lifted off of her face, she saw that Shelly was the one smothering her. Can you imagine waking up to your own mother smothering you? That's... No, that's such a betrayal, especially at a so age. deeply traumatic. Again. Yeah, can't even. To make it even worse, Shelley then convinced Nikki that she was just having a bad dream and nothing was actually going on, and they both went back to sleep. As for Dave, he didn't even know what he was getting into at first, and Shelley's abuse of her children was still a secret at this time, and he himself would soon become a victim. Now, we'll see through this case if you can argue if David was just this victim that was completely manipulated or, which I think most of us will see that he was an accomplice, uh, unfortunately, over time. So eventually, Shelly, her children, and Dave decided to move to Raymond. Raymond was a tight-knit community with a population of less than 2,000 people. And Dave and Shelly built up a good reputation in town. Dave was a reliable contractor, and Shelly seemed like a good Samaritan who was always willing to help those in need. When they moved in, Nikki was 12 years old and Sammy was 9. Once they were a family unit all living together, Shelly began to break Dave down. She began to isolate him from his friends and family, and like her previous marriages, she forced him to do all of the chores. The emotional and physical abuse escalated over the months, and it got to the point where she would beat him if she thought he wasn't working hard enough for the family if the chores weren't done, or if she was just in a bad mood. She'd also call him worthless, a terrible father, and a terrible husband. And Dave did feel useless and humiliated. 
He desperately wanted Shelly's love and affection. And after the cycle of abuse, she would give him what he wanted and shower him with love. She would apologize and say she would never treat him like that again, but the cycle would continue over the next several years. And the abuse had gotten so bad that Nikki and Sammy once caught Dave putting a shotgun barrel in his mouth. And Shelly convinced him to not go through with it. In the no-tech house, her abuse didn't stop with Dave. The family eventually moved into a craftsman home in Old Willapa after Shelly lost her grandmother's house to foreclosure. It was at this house that Shelly began abusing Nikki more often. Many nights she would beat Nikki with a phone cord until she bled. Nikki later said, quote, My mother was like a ticking time bomb. I never knew when she would go off. And during one beating, Shelly pushed Nikki hard against the wall. A nail had been sticking out where a picture once hung. And that nail went into Nikki's head. Another time she pushed her through a plate glass door, causing cuts all over her body. Shelly then told Nikki, look what you made me do. Despite the blood and serious injuries, Shelly never took Nikki to the hospital, and Shelly would find any excuse to continue physically abusing Nikki. To hide the physical abuse, Shelly forced Nikki to wear makeup on her skin and ballet tights under her shorts when she played volleyball at Raymond Elementary so no one would see her bruises and cuts. Shelly wanted total control over Nikki, just like she controlled Dave. And the more Shelly enjoyed the abuse, the worse it got. Sometimes she would pin Nikki to the ground and call her a bitch and a pig while punching and slapping her. And just like with Dave, after the abuse was over, Shelly would apologize and tell Nikki how much she loved her. Shelly wanted Nikki to be desperate for affection, and she wanted her to feel like she had to go through hell and back in order to earn it. At school, Nikki never told friends or faculty what was going on at home, and she never told any of their extended family members either. The only people who knew about the abuse were the people living in the Notech household. Although Nikki was Shelly's main target, she also emotionally abused her younger daughter, Sammy. Any kind of fun was limited in this house. Shelly restricted what food everyone could eat and when they were allowed to eat. She also restricted how often her daughters could use the bathroom. They had to request using the toilet and Shelly would go in with them and monitor how they used it. She also rarely allowed them to bathe and made them go to school in dirty clothes, which is heartbreaking. Shelly even named one of her favorite forms of torture. She called it wallowing. Basically, on a random night, Shelly would burst into Nikki's room and start screaming at her, berating her. She would then command her to get out of bed and strip naked. Then she would order Nikki outside while scolding her and calling her names through the house. Once they got to the backyard, she would order Nikki to squat down naked in the mud. The worst part is, well, I actually don't know what the worst part is, but Shelly did this during fall and winter when it was cold outside, sometimes freezing. And then Shelly would order Nikki to begin rolling around like a pig in the mud. Then Dave would take the hose, the garden hose, and spray her down with freezing cold water. All the while, Shelly is calling her a pig and other names and telling her to roll over. Sometimes this could last for hours. And after it was over, they would drag Nikki into the bathroom and force her into a bath of scalding hot water. So was there a potential that neighbors could have seen this going on because you would think i mean in the middle of fall and winter if i looked out my window and i saw a People little girl screaming. rolling around in the mud screaming getting blasted with cold water it'd be that's a great question very alarming to me i do not have the address of this residence but maybe it wasn't close enough where anybody could be see them or maybe they're just on a part of the side of the house that was kind of obstructed from if it's anything like their last property it's uh not closely adjacent to other houses it's There's kind a, of like a half semi-rural area kind of like outskirts of the suburbs type interesting uh just horrible though yeah um, sometimes she would even lock her daughters in their bedrooms for hours or even days at a time one summer nikki was locked in her room almost every single day shelly gave her a bucket to use as a toilet but nikki later admitted that she didn't mind being locked up in her room because it gave her a break from the physical abuse and she would spend her time reading books. In a strange way, being locked away in a room gave her moments of peace. As for Sammy, she wasn't treated as harshly as her sister. She had a way of flattering Shelly to get on her good side, but on Shelly's worst days, even Sammy couldn't avoid her mother's wrath. And like always, after the reign of terror, Shelly would apologize and shower them with love 
at the end of every cycle of abuse. For example, every Christmas she would buy them tons of gifts and make them feel special. But whenever she felt like it, Shelly could take the gifts and put them in her closet and tape the door with masking tape. If the seal was ever broken, she would then know that the girls tried to get the gifts back, and if they did, she would beat them. As time went on, Shelly tried to get more creative with her abusive tactics, and all Nikki and Sammy wanted was to please their mother. They were conditioned to want those tiny bits of affection from her whenever they could get them, and the only other type of affection they got in their life was from each other. And through the abuse, Nikki and Sammy grew incredibly close, and Shelly saw their relationship as a threat. As a way to break their spirits, Shelly would treat Sammy better than Nikki. She would shower Sammy with love to try and make Nikki jealous, and this would drive a wedge between the sisters. But no matter how hard Shelly tried, she couldn't break the sisters' bond that they shared. They always comforted each other after the abuse, and sometimes they would sneak into each other's bedrooms at night and tell each other stories. Or they would make up fantasies about how they would lock up their mother in the crawl space and escape the house once and for all. But in the end, these were just stories they told in order to comfort themselves. They had been conditioned to believe that going against their mother would end in misery and pain, or even death. Shelley's abuse would soon extend beyond her immediate family, though. In 1988, her 13-year-old nephew, Shane Watson, came to live with them. His father was Shelly's brother, Paul, and he was constantly in and out of jail for running with a motorcycle gang, and Shane had been living with his grandparents since Paul's divorce. He had recently become too much to handle for the grandparents, so Shelly took Shane in, and she did it to look like a loving, selfless hero. But behind closed doors, she used this new arrangement to her advantage. She saw Shane as a vulnerable target she could abuse next, but she made sure to make him feel comfortable in the home first. So after he moved in, Nikki and Sammy grew to love Shane like a brother, and he came to see Shelly and Dave like the parents he never had. Dave even thought of Shane as his own son. He even taught him how to surf. But these relationships would come at a cost. Shane was entering the first stages of the no-tech cycle of abuse. Now that Shane felt strong bonds of love in their home, Shelly knew it was time to break him down. It first started with Shelly giving Shane chores, which didn't seem like a problem at first, but the list of chores started getting longer and longer and longer. Shane was willing to put up with it because Shelly had graciously taken him into her home and set him up in his own private bedroom in the basement. But it got to a point where the chores became impossible to do, especially within the time that he was expected to get them done in. By now, Shelly knew how to slowly escalate the abuse from slight hits or pushes to full on whipping and kicking. She eventually took away his bathing privileges and his only form of bathing became wallowing and then being dunked in scalding water like the girls. Then Shelly began taking his personal belongings until he had none left. Occasionally, Shelly would force Shane and Nikki, who were both teenagers and cousins, to slow dance naked in the living room. Dave and Sammy were then forced to watch. Shelly hoped it would humiliate them both and destroy their personal identities. Supposedly, there wasn't a sexual motive for Shelly with this abuse. It was strictly to embarrass and dehumanize them so Shelly could have control. And at night, Shane was forced to sleep on the basement floor without a pillow or even a blanket. And the psychological abuse made him believe he deserved the punishment. Just like Shelly did with everyone else in the house, she would love bomb Shane every once in a while to make him desperately want her affection even more. I do want to make one note by now in this story. If there are any listeners who are considering like oh why are these people just putting up with it and not running away and not contacting police you might not be grasping the psychological destruction that's occurring in this house and we've covered other cases too as well like the girl in the box and things like this where not only can a, an extreme manipulator manipulate people into harming other people but you can also manipulate people into just staying where they are and never seeking help especially when love bombing is involved as well exactly because it's creating that false illusion that she does actually care about them and that she does have their best interests in mind but and she knows full well that she's going to get the reaction that she's getting when she does that exactly. and she's sort of like she knows she's pushing them away through the abuse but by then showering them with love more so than normal they're going to come back and be like oh well maybe she does really love us because she's saying all this now and apologizing and exactly and that becomes the single greatest thing that they want in life is to get back to that 
the end of the cycle where the love bombing comes, it becomes this reward for them. So I just wanted to make that note going forward because uh, I know a lot of our listeners are empathetic and they know true crime well enough. But if there are any new listeners who are wondering about this, this is a grade A manipulation and psychological control happening here in this household. Yeah, it's equally physically abusive as it is psychologically abusive. Exactly. With the holidays right around the corner, you probably started your holiday shopping for your friends and family, and maybe many of them live far away from you. So you got to go to the post office, you got to ship those packages off in time for the holidays. Well, avoid the long lines at the post office and do everything from the comfort of your own home or office with stamps.com. I'm a big fan of stamps.com. I've been using them for years for all of our postage needs, whether it's personal packages to merch orders to CBD products, we have used stamps.com to save us thousands and thousands of dollars on postage because with stamps.com, they give you huge carrier discounts up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. And they even tell you the cheapest and fastest shipping options. You can even order shipping and mailing supplies, labels, and even printers from their supply store. What's great about stamps.com is all you need is a ordinary printer and a computer, and they'll even send you a free scale when you get started with stamps.com. One of my favorite features of stamps.com though is that you can even schedule package pickup right through the stamps.com dashboard. It really makes everything seamless. It connects with all of the online marketplaces and saves you a ton of money. Give your business the gift to stamps.com so your mailing and shipping is covered this holiday season. Sign up with promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage in a digital scale. There's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com Click the microphone at the top of the page and enter code L-I-G-T-S-O-U-T. By 1989, Shelley became pregnant with her third baby at the age of 34. This was also her first child with her husband, Dave. Around the same time, her hairdresser and close friend from South Bend named Kathy Loreno had recently fallen on hard times. Kathy was comfortable enough around Shelly that she told her she had recently broken up with her boyfriend and she could no longer afford her living situation. So Shelly saw how vulnerable she was in this moment. So on the back of her mind, she thought, or the front of her mind, she thought Kathy could come into her home. She would give her room and board in exchange for Kathy being their live-in nanny for their forthcoming child. Shelly made everyone believe she was bringing Kathy in because she was just this caring and loving person, right? And that's what she wanted to project to her community. But Shelly was only adding another victim to her abuse. And just before Kathy moved into the home, Shelly gave birth to Tori Notek in June of 1989. Dave would later say that this was not just the happiest moment, but the only happy moment in his entire marriage. It is also important to note, at which this is shocking, that by this time, Dave still believed that Shelly had cancer. Just when they first started dating and before they married, she tried to sell him on this idea. Dave still believes that this is going on. And here's why. She had been faking going to chemotherapy appointments. At one point when they first started dating, she even shaved her eyebrows and her head to convince him of this lie. But here's the thing, you're not supposed to get pregnant while on chemotherapy. There are a lot of complications here. A lot of people just can't. Women can have problems with fertility or could possibly become infertile altogether while going through certain kinds of chemotherapy. Even when a woman gets pregnant while on chemotherapy, it can severely harm the fetus, cause birth defects or cause miscarriages. So there are a lot of complications involved, but I don't know what, maybe Dave just didn't understand this. And according to Dave, he truly believed that Shelly had cancer and was going through chemotherapy at this time. He must not have known. Yeah, he must Because otherwise, I think that would raise a raise suspicion for anybody else. Unless if it was where he maybe did consider it, but the abuse yeah. was making him push those thoughts down or something. Well, I mean, if you think about it, if somebody says they have cancer and you believe you're taking them to chemotherapy appointments. The last thing you want to do to somebody with cancer is accuse like them of faking cancer, right? Right. right? I mean, that would be, and it's also his wife. So 
he knows there's major negative re repercussions to just even suggesting that she might be faking it. It's a good point. And Shelly, like this is a great example of the cloaks that she wears to convince people of things happening or her being someone who she's not. And she can even convince, you know, people who are closest to her, which is mind boggling. It's just pure evil. It really is. Like this yes. is diabolical what she's doing. I, I don't want to make a hot comment here, but I will say manipulators who are also murderers are personally the scariest thing for me. Oh yeah. Like those, just the grade A, which we come across serial killers who are like this, the, just the scariest people to me are people who have perfected manipulation. And especially when they're manipulating their own family members. To me, that is like the most evil you can get. Absolutely. Yes. To convince Dave that there were some medical complications with Tori, Shelley went through a phase of Manchausen syndrome by proxy. So if you don't know, um, the National Library of Medicine describes Manchausen syndrome by proxy as, quote, a fictitious disorder characterized by fabrication or induction of signs or symptoms of a disease, as well as alteration of laboratory tests. So these basically are just fabricated physical signs and symptoms, and then you're fudging the numbers on the laboratory tests and papers. Uh, there's a great example of this in media. It's a book, and I believe they also turned it into... There's there, a show too, right? Yes. For it's, it. it's a HBO series. It's called Sharp Objects. Um, it's written by Gillian Flynn. I've actually read the book. It's a great book. It's her first book. She also wrote Gone Girl. That's her big hit. Oh, okay. This book and HBO series depicts what this is. I think it gives a very good overview of what's going on. Obviously, it's a fictional tale, but she does a great job at de depicting Manchausen syndrome by proxy. And I'm sure many of you have heard of of this before. The one of the most infamous cases regarding this this syndrome is the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case. Yeah, if you ever, yeah. If you've ever seen uh, anything on that or read about that? I mean, that's like, I mean, that's a very very prime example of of what Munchausen syndrome looks like. And I believe I can't remember. I haven't seen the movie in years, but I believe the Sixth Sense also one of the victims mm. of that story. They touch on that i think the mother is maybe drugging the child until she actually passes away yeah wow so in this case shelly was making it look like or causing her newborn child to be sick after she was born and this is this is awful she would supposedly smother tori with a pillow behind closed doors and then she would come out with the child and basically say look this child's having trouble breathing and it's from her illness oh my god She's just like next level evil. Yeah. Now that Dave believed that their newborn was sick, he didn't want Kathy to move in at all. But Shelly convinced him that she needed someone to help look after Tori. So Kathy ended up moving in with a full house of seven people, including herself. And just like Shane, Kathy was super thankful to Shelly. And that's the other thing too, is like Shelly's providing everybody a service of some sort, whether it's a home or love, whatever it may be. And so these people are, in need of this and they don't want to lose that so they're willing to subject themselves to to this abuse in order to keep keep this great thing that they have she, in their minds she makes this narrative and she makes it true that these people are dependent on her yeah for dependency. whatever like you were saying love shelter etc and i always think of shane's a great example because shane probably came from a rough household and he had never seen a household filled with love and like sisters and a dad who takes him surfing. So that's maybe all he wants. And then when he's stripped of that, he just wants to get back to it. So, yeah. And they, and they know too, like the other reason why they don't just up and leave is because there's nowhere to go. They yeah. don't have any other options. So this is the only option that they have and they've grown accustomed to it. So they're just dealing with it just day by day to keep what they have despite how absolutely hor horrific it is. Yeah. Kathy also told Shelly that she would do anything to help out with the baby or other things around the house. And just like the others, Shelly slowly broke Kathy down. And again, it started with a long list of chores and no matter how hard Kathy tried to help, it was never good enough for Shelly. Whenever Kathy threatened to leave, Shelly would guilt trip her saying she was abandoning a sick baby. Then she would isolate Kathy to make her more codependent. And if her friends or family ever try to call up the house in order to check up on Kathy, 
Shelly would always answer and tell them that Kathy didn't want to speak with him. So now also creating a, a divide between Kathy and her own family, another way to manipulate. Sometimes she could sell them the idea that Kathy no longer wanted a relationship with certain people. She later convinced many of Kathy's family members that Kathy had moved away with her boyfriend. Early on, there was one time Kathy tried to leave the house, but she only got a quarter mile down the road before Shelly caught up to her and convinced her in coming back. As years passed, it got to the point where many of Kathy's family members accepted that Kathy had just straight cut them off. And with this, Shelly got one more step forward in having complete control over her. In a disturbing way, Nikki, Sammy, and Shane liked having Kathy around because with Kathy there, all of Shelly's abuse was directed towards her instead of them. To take it a step further, Shelly began drugging Kathy with sleeping pills, and when Kathy was disoriented, Shelly began telling her that she was constantly sleepwalking to the fridge and eating all the food. She'd even put food crumbs on Kathy's bed to convince her that she was in fact sleepwalking and just binge eating throughout the night. Kathy ended up believing her and feeling guilty over it, and then Shelly convinced her that during her sleepwalking, she was also sneaking into Shane's bedroom and making sexual advances toward him. So just escalating it you know every time she believes a lie that Shelly gives her she just takes it to the next level and Shelly then forced Shane to back up these claims by this point Kathy had lost track of reality and believed anything Shelly told her and then Shelly took all of her personal items away including her clothing and this is when the severe physical abuse started Shelly would use any household object as a weapon her choice was often a phone cord She'd also push Kathy down the stairs, beat her to the ground, and kick her in the abdomen. All the while, Kathy would still do all the chores around the house, naked. Sometimes she was ordered to crawl through the house instead of walking. And just like Shane, Shelly started forcing Kathy to sleep on the basement floor with absolutely nothing. Other times, she forced Shane and her daughters to physically beat Kathy as well. One time, she even commanded them to stab her with scissors. And if they ever refused, Shelly would beat them or put them through. A wallowing session. Even though the children would assault Kathy, Kathy still felt sorry for the kids. She knew that if they ever defied Shelly, she would do horrible things to them. At some point, Nikki and Sammy were forced to follow Kathy around the house while she did her chores, and if she wasn't working hard enough, they would snap her with rubber bands. When the children abused Kathy, Shelly would jump in and act like she was protecting Kathy from the abuse. She would stage the assault and then come in and act like she's the hero. By this time, during all the manipulation and the gaslighting, Kathy had understood something fundamental about the no-tech house of abuse. She realized that Shelly would have one main target at a time, and when she was targeting one person, she would basically ignore the others. After realizing this, Kathy decided to keep herself as a main target of abuse for as long as she could in order to protect the children. And if the children ever tried to comfort her, she would push them away, because she feared if Shelly ever saw them doing that, she would then come after them as well. As for Dave, he worked Monday through Friday, so he wasn't home as often as the rest. And when he was home, he sometimes lived outside in a tent and gave almost all of his money to Shelly. But he would also join in on the physical abuse. On one bad day, Shelly decided that Kathy needed severe punishment. She forced Kathy outside in the freezing cold during the winter. She then commanded Kathy to climb a snow-covered hill just behind the house and Dave was standing at the top of that hill. And once Kathy reached the top, he would shove her down the hill. And she had to do that over and over and over again until she was completely exhausted. Each time she rolled down the hill, she hit sharp rocks and patches of gravel on the way down, and the whole family was forced to watch as Kathy went up and down the hill for hours. By the end of it, Nikki, Sammy, and Shane could see a red stripe of blood up the hillside where she had fallen countless times. All the while, the children were still in school full time, and they just had to act like everything was normal at home. But Nikki and Shane struggled, as you can imagine, in completing schoolwork. Surprisingly, Sammy still had a functional social life and even a boyfriend. Sometimes her boyfriend and her friends would even come over to the house, but Shelly always knew how to make everything look like it was completely normal. There was nothing weird going on. Before anyone arrived, she would take Kathy out to the shed and lock her inside, where she would be kept for hours at a time until the guests left. She was a master at keeping up appearances inside and outside of the home. The family would even go on vacation together, including Kathy. But Kathy was essentially treated like a servant the entire time. And when they traveled in the car, she was kept in the trunk. 
and when they went camping, Kathy was forced to sleep in the car while the others got tents and sleeping bags. But no matter how hard Shelly tried to maintain control over everyone in the household, some did try to escape over the years. Everyone except for Dave. But it didn't matter, Shelly would always find them. Her skills at finding her victims were so good that some called her a quote-unquote master hunter. Not only could she track them down, but through manipulation tactics, she could always get them to return to the house. Once she got them back, she wouldn't punish them. Instead, she would give them affection and love and make them feel welcome. She thought if she gave them that small amount of affection that they craved, they would never try to run away again. By the summer of 1992, Kathy and Shane had been living at the Notex home for roughly three to four years. Shane and Nikki were 17, Sammy was 14, and Tori was only three. And the Notex decided to move to a small house on Monahan Landing Road in Raymond. Once they moved in, Shelly forced everyone except herself to renovate the house. And it took Nikki the entire summer to repaint the shed because she was only given a one-inch brush. Of course, if anyone wasn't working hard enough, Shelly would dole out her usual beatings. She began focusing her abuse mostly on Shane. She once duct-taped him to a wall for hours and made him sleep on a concrete floor. Another time, she forced him to strip naked in front of the entire family. She then bound his hands and feet in duct tape before applying Icy Hot to his genitals. After seeing this, Kathy tried to redirect Shelly's abuse toward herself so she could protect Shane, and unfortunately, this would come at a great cost. Shelly would then force her to sleep in the outhouse on the property. She also took severe beatings worse than ever before. And the others could see bruises, welts, and open wounds across Kathy's body as she crawled across the house naked. Then she was forced to bathe with a hose outside without soap, and Shelly began to experiment with Kathy's hygiene. She'd even pour bleach on her wounds, and then proceed to call her a pig. And as the bleach seeped into those wounds, Kathy would try to scream out in pain, but Dave would gag her and tape her mouth shut. Then Dave and Shelly would waterboard her with a homemade device that Dave had built. As the torture and abuse escalated, Shelly wouldn't let Kathy eat food, sometimes for days on end, and she began feeding her expired or even sometimes rotten food. She would mix moldy vegetables and old food in a blender and force Kathy to drink it. Usually Kathy was so starving she'd eat anything that was given to her just to survive. Another time she forced Kathy to eat an entire cup of salt. Over the years it had gotten to the point that Kathy would begin just full on collapsing from exhaustion, abuse, and malnutrition. By now she had lost over 100 pounds and her hair had begun to fall out and many of her teeth were missing. She had become so weak that Dave and Shelly had to drag her to and from the outhouse when they wanted to torture her. It got to the point where her cognitive skills began failing as well. The others once saw Kathy sitting on the couch trying to solve one of baby Tori's puzzle games, but she just couldn't do it. Eventually she couldn't even walk or speak anymore. The left side of her face drooped and her vision had deteriorated. At any given time, she was also covered in her own spit and vomit. When she first began living with the Notex, she was healthy, but as you can imagine, six years of serious abuse had taken its toll. One day in July 1994, Dave heard strange gargling noises coming from the laundry room where they had imprisoned Kathy. He knew she had been in poor health and been checking on her every once in a while, but when he went in to inspect what the noise was, that's when he found Kathy on the floor, unresponsive, and her mouth was covered in vomit. He tried to open her airways, turn her on her side, and perform CPR on her, but according to him, it was far too late. Kathy had sadly died after choking on her own vomit. And, of course, they refused to notify police of her death because of the obvious signs of severe abuse across her body. Instead, Shelly took the kids out of the house for the night and left them in a hotel. With the kids out of the house, they burned Kathy's body to ashes in the backyard. Shelly told her daughters and Shane that all of them would be in jail if anyone found out about what had happened. Supposedly, Shelly also threatened to kill them all, including herself, if they told anyone. When Kathy's mother reported her missing in 1994, the police saw that Kathy's financial transactions had stopped somewhere around 1989 or 1990. Then the police visited Kathy's last known address, which was the Notex house. Shelly told police that Kathy had run away with what she called her trucker friend, off to California. 
Shelley had even forged letters and postcards from across the U.S. showing that Kathy had been sending her letters while she was out on the road, and the police had no reason to doubt her. So after this, the investigation quickly went cold, and now that Kathy was gone, no one could redirect Shelley's abuse away from Shane. And Shelley soon convinced Dave that Shane was about to turn them into the police. She also convinced Dave that they had to get rid of Shane in order to protect themselves. Unknown to them at the time, Shane supposedly had photographs of the abuse and torture that they had put Kathy through. They showed her naked and wounded, and Shelley then showed Dave a pair of blood-soaked underwear and claimed that it was evidence that Shane had been sexually assaulting Nikki. Obviously, this was just another one of Shelley's lies, but Dave fell for it, and he began beating Shane. Meanwhile, Shane began secretly telling Nikki how he had photos of Kathy and he was ready to go to the police. Nikki was torn as much as she wanted the abuse to end, she was also terrified of her mother. Since she had gotten away with everything for years, she couldn't see the end of it. She thought her mother's reign of terror would literally go on forever. And she ended up telling Shelly about the supposed photographs. Shelly furiously searched for those photos, but she never found them. So she sent Dave to take care of him. Shane had survived the no tech house of horrors for seven long years. But one night in February 1995 would sadly be the end. It's unclear exactly what happened, but it ended with Dave fatally shooting Shane outside with a 22 caliber rifle. He then wrapped his remains in a sleeping bag and burned it in the backyard. To cover up both murders, they scattered Kathy and Shane's ashes in the Pacific Ocean. The only difference was that Nikki and Sammy were aware of what had happened to Kathy, but they did not know what happened to Shane. Shelley confidently told them that Shane ran away to become a fisherman in Alaska which this wasn't that far-fetched because a lot of local boys at the time were moving up coast to work on fishing boats. She even claimed that he called her recently and he was happy in his new life. She also said Shane had given her a new birdhouse and wrote a nice note before he left. But Nikki could sense that her mother was lying and she knew that Shane hated Shelly with a passion and her mother wouldn't just let Shane up and leave. By the time Nikki was 18, she tried to move away to college it had been her dream to finally leave her parents' house of whores and go to school. But Shelly did everything in her power to keep Nikki at home. Finally, Nikki actually began fighting back physically and emotionally. If her mother ever hit her, she would hit her back, which shocked everyone in the house because no one had ever stood up to Shelly before. Seeing that Nikki might actually cause everyone to revolt, Shelly ended up sending Nikki to live with an aunt. Nikki never returned to the Notek house. She begged her aunt to never send her back, but she didn't explain why. She didn't go into the detail about all the abuse or the murders. At some point later, she tried to tell the police about what had happened, but the brief investigation didn't go beyond a few questions, as they saw that Shelly and Dave had no criminal history. And the children's school records were also useless at showing that anything was off about the family. They all had had decent grades and were involved in extracurricular activities outside of class, so the police really didn't look into it any further. And when they tried to contact Nikki for a follow-up interview, she had already left town. Now that Nikki was gone and Kathy and Shane were deceased, Sammy became the main target of abuse back at the Notek house. Sammy used to be the favorite, but Shelly was running out of victims. Luckily, when the abuse escalated, Sammy decided to escape when she was 17 and she ran away to her boyfriend's house and then eventually made it to her grandmother Laura's house. Laura had loosely stayed in contact with the kids over the years and she allowed Sammy to stay with her. Occasionally, she returned to check on her little sister, Tori, but other than that, she never returned. The only people left in the house of horrors were Shelly, Dave, and Tori. Since Dave worked full-time, it was mostly only Shelly and Tori. And like always, Shelly would do anything to find someone she could abuse, and there was only one victim left. Up until now, Tori had mostly avoided her mother's wrath, but now Shelly subjected her to the same cycle of abuse as everyone else, except now... Shelly had gotten more creative. By the time Tori was 14, Shelly started doing quote unquote progress checks where Tori was forced to strip naked while Shelly examined her during her early stages of puberty. She even got Tori to snip off her new pubic hair to keep as a memento in her baby book. Shelly even locked Tori in a dog kennel full of feces and sprayed her with a garden hose. But the humiliation and abuse weren't enough to fulfill Shelly. So she did what she did best and searched for a new victim. During all this, there was another suspected victim of Shelley's. This was an 81-year-old retired merchant crewman, a Pearl Harbor veteran, and a widower named James, who went by Mac McClintock. 
Shelly, so she had been working as a caregiver for the local elderly folks for, for many years at this point. And after getting close with James, she manipulated him into changing his will so his entire estate was left to Shelly. And soon after the changes were made, of course, he mysteriously died from a head injury. As the story goes, he might have fallen out of his wheelchair and hit his head on the way down. Supposedly, when Shelly discovered him, there was blood everywhere and he was already deceased. But others believe that Shelly had actually hit him over the head with a blunt object, or she might have just neglected him to the point where he had died. I wouldn't put it past her. Yeah. In the end, James' death on February 9th, 2002 was determined to be an accident, and police did not investigate anything beyond that, which is crazy because there was clearly motive because Shelly took over his $140,000 home, $5,000 in cash, and even took his dog named Sissy. I wonder if the police even knew that he had signed the will over to her. I mean, unless they're just that bad at investigating and they didn't do a full blown investigation, they just kind of like looked at the scene and they're like, oh, it looks like this old man fell out his chair and hit his head. End I, of story. A part of me thinks that maybe the police is, a, is not doing what they could. We now we have two people missing from this home and a man that was in contact with Shelly is now mysteriously dying. I mean, I could, I could give them the benefit of the doubt, but it seems like by now, maybe police should be adding up. Yeah. What's going on? I don't know about you, but for the longest time, I was a huge delivery app guy. I would order all my food through the delivery apps from all my favorite restaurants or even groceries through the delivery apps. But man, does that get expensive. But all that changed when I started using every plate. Every plate is the budget meal kit company that's 25% cheaper than grocery shopping and way cheaper than ordering food through the delivery apps. And there's no hidden fees with that. I can't tell you how many times I've made a home cooked meal and I put together the grocery list and I end up having to buy way too many ingredients. And then I just have all this extra food that I don't end up using, go to waste. And ultimately I'm losing money because I got way more than I need. Every plate takes that out of the equation. Everything comes prepackaged right to your door with simple recipe cards with step-by-step -step instructions. And with a jam-packed holiday season upon us, you can count on every plate to make meal times easier without compromising on quality. Every plate recipes include only the highest quality ingredients, including sustainably sourced seafood that meets the Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood ranking, so you know your meals will be fresh and flavorful. So right now you can take advantage of this special offer and get a meal for $1.49 plus $1 steaks by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49 lights out. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal plus $1 steaks by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering that code 49 lights out. That's up to $110 value. Take advantage today. I promise you won't be disappointed. In Shelley's search for another victim, she ended up finding a man named Ronald Woodworth, who went by Ron. He was a 57-year-old veteran who had been working in the healthcare system, and Ron had been going through a lot in the past few months. He had a rough breakup with his boyfriend in San Diego. He had lost his house to foreclosure, and he had recently moved to Raymond. Ron had also struggled with substance abuse over the years, and his dad, who had been taking care of his elderly mother, had also recently passed away. Shelley became Ron's mother-at-home health provider, which was how she first met Ron. Like always, Shelley wanted to look like the hero who had helped someone in need. So when Ron was down on his luck, she offered him a place to stay. So he moved into their house during the fall of 2001. In the first few months, Ron always treated Tori with kindness and respect. He would read her stories and they would play games together. Shelley had made Ron feel comfortable in the house before she worked out her perfectly crafted series of manipulations and abuses. The chores, the strict bathroom privileges, beatings, and isolation began. Meanwhile, Dave worked full-time contract work about 160 miles away from home, so Shelley had Ron mostly to herself, and over time she had conditioned Ron to stay away from the police. The sheriff's deputies were now aware that something strange might be going on with Shelley's tenants, so they checked in on Ron occasionally, but he would always run and hide from them. 
The deputies just saw this as odd behavior and didn't think there was anything malicious going on. But Shelly's abuse quickly escalated. and She eventually forced Ron to do things like drink his own urine and once made him jump off the roof and injure himself. Then she treated his injuries with boiling water and bleach. Tori described Ron's smell as, quote, like bleach and decomposing flesh, like it was burning his skin off. He smelled like that for a month up until the very end. Just like Kathy, Ron's cognitive functions eventually began to fail. And after three years of living with Shelley, Ron passed away sometime in August of 2003. His true cause of death is still a mystery to this day. And his death marked the last one in Shelley Notek's house. On the day of Ron's death, Shelley called Dave when he was at work and told him that Ron had committed suicide and he needed to come home and help deal with the body. So she put his body in the freezer for four days until Dave could return home and bury it four feet down in the backyard. He concealed the spot in a pile of brush. They couldn't burn his body because it was the middle of summer and the town had an imposed a burn ban. Meanwhile, Shelley kept Ron's death a secret from Tori and she sent Tori to stay with Sammy for a bit. But this would turn out to be a huge mistake for Shelley. With all three sisters free from her grasp, they all talked together outside of Shelley's presence. And once Tori told them about the abuse she was put through, Nikki and Sammy went to the police station together on August 7, 2003, and refused to leave until the police took them seriously. After they told their stories, CPS took Tori into their care, and finally, an official investigation was opened. When Shelly heard the news, she supposedly sent Dave over to the police station, hoping he could smooth things over. They thought they could get Tori back in their custody. But right as Dave arrived at the Pacific County Sheriff's Department, police began questioning him, and Shelly's plan backfired. Shelly had chosen Dave all those years ago because he was easy to crack, under pressure, and manipulate. And that's exactly what happened while he was with the police. Dave ended up telling them almost everything. But old habits die hard and he still tried to defend Shelly. Let's take a look at a few clips from the police interview. And once again, my wife, I mean, I love her dearly, and she, there's no way that she caused any abuse on Ron or Kathy or anything. And, and if she didn't call, you know, when Ron passed on, it was just out of fear and fear what happened in the past. And like I say, my wife, she, she worries about everything, and she was just looking after her, her family again, Tori, me. You know, she's just be, being the protector that she always is. I asked her what was going on. I mean, I just wanted to know because I had noticed a couple of days prior that Kathy's vision was a little not right. And I asked if she'd, you know, fallen or or, or did she got into something and taken something or because it, I did a little finger test on her she wasn't you know staying with my finger there a few days ago and she says no not that I was aware of you see so in her eyes you think, yes I do let's see if she followed yes yeah. yeah so she wasn't coherent and I mean she's coherent but her balance was off she she walked her. She stayed Yeah, you know, she stumbled a little bit. So that day, I guess she'll, you know, said she always oh, she wasn't feeling so good. She was, she was lying down most of the day. And um, so, how many times, you know, when you talk about you went in there and you checked on her periodically? Yeah. By the time you go in there and you find her not breathing from the time before that, how how much time do you figure oh, when she was okay? probably checking her like i don't know every half hour okay so we're saying that half hour here half hour there everything's yeah. fine whatever and then the last time you looked she's fine was she what was she doing last time you saw her was she just she's laying on her back as she's breathing then just normal everything normal but a little labor breathing like i had stated earlier today to right. just breathing a little hard okay. yeah and, uh, Okay, so now we're, this this is what's going to happen. Then what took place after that? Well, Shell got home. We didn't want the kids to find out anything. Mm -hmm. So later that night, I, I did it in, in haste. I didn't know what to do. 
I mean, we thought something was wrong with Kathy. I mean, I don't know what was wrong with her, why. And we were too, this had never happened before, and we were terrified. Can you, can you explain how you came across Kathy and about the time frame? This was in 19 what? This is 1990. In 1990. Or 91. Okay. And can you kind of go over some of the details of what, what transpired there for me? So they're in your words. Okay, it was an evening. I just came home from work. I was working on the road for set vlogging. And uh, I came home and so she had to go get Leslie down at Grayland. She worked at the Sea Star. I says, okay. So she said, and she says, Kathy's not feeling so good today. She said, they're lying down in the bed by the laundry room. I says, okay. I'll keep an eye on her. And so I did. And she took off with uh, Sammy and Tori to Grayland. And Shane stayed back with me. Shane was in the kitchen doing the dishes. And I periodically was checking on Kathy and she was laboring and breathing a little bit. There was a few times I checked on her and she was, she still seemed to be in the same condition she was when I came home. And uh, so I went in there another time, a third or fourth time to check on her and I noticed that she had stopped breathing. And I will approach Kathy and I, I went up and I shook her and I, I, I asked her a name and if she was all right, but I didn't, she gave me no response. And I, Well, I know that you went through the fire of the felony one. It's important that I get the name of your warrant. We talked about vomit. I, I rolled her on her side and I and I knelt down and put my head there to see if she's breathing or if her chest was rising or not, but neither was happening. And then I checked her pulse. She didn't have a pulse. And I looked at her passageway. You know, in her mouth was full of, looked like vomit, had been there a little while. And her nostrils were full of it. And she's lying flat on her back, and I believe she had thrown up and it got lodged in there and she stopped breathing. So I, I like I said, I had her on her side and I tried to clean out her air passage, but I wasn't having a lot of luck. It was completely full. And so I tried doing CPR, but no, no air or artificial breathing, whichever one, but no air was getting to her lungs. You know, and I tried this several times with my chest compressions, but nothing was happening. All I could do was chest compressions. I even tried putting her arm, like, picked her up and in her sitting position and because Kathy was heavy and I couldn't get her on her feet and I wanted and I tried to do the high me mm -hmm. you know to make her to force some stuff out so I could get air to her but it didn't work so I I did all this for five or ten minutes and I realized she was gone then um, with wrong What's wrong here just recently? The information was that uh, he also was deceased and that you disposed of his body and that was not burned? No, sir. And um, your understanding of how he died is how? Well, I, I, I say suicidal. He attempted his own life and I believe he could have completed his wishes upon after a few days of his death. I mean, I discovered the two medication bottles that Shell had discovered missing in a bathroom, which Ron had been in because we were, she was trying to fix his feet and patch up the other dings he had on him due to when he jumped out of a tree to try and take his own life, which he iterated back to her. After watching that, my 
my initial reaction is it seems very obvious to me and i'm sure to the detective interviewing him that he's being deceptive i mean he's like looking down the entire time and he's kind of speaking very slowly and doesn't seem very confident what he's saying and do you feel like he he's feeling remorseful while recounting some of that or do you feel like it's just all part of the act i think it's hard to i think hard to he, say, i think he does feel resentful this is a tough one because i think it's a case of him being a victim and an accomplice which is really hard to yeah parse. yeah but i think maybe at least for me if i was in that detective shoes i think one of the biggest red flags is so you notice this woman was maybe incoherent she wasn't following his fingers with the eye test she had labored breathing yet didn't take her to the hospital call 911 get an ambulance out there none of that mm -hmm. so i think that might be the biggest red flag here and i do think i don't, part of me thinks he's just he's he wants to come forward but he's not saying everything right now he's still scared about yeah. what shelly might do yeah so pretty much after this interview takes place the police are pretty certain that they know what what really happened here and so they proceed to arrest dave and then subsequently shelly and this was on august 8th 2003. while in custody dave then joined several investigators at the property and showed them where they burned kathy's corpse and then he proceeds to casually confess that he shot shane by the shed at the time the officers didn't know shane was even a victim yet Dave was then brought back to the police station to confess what he hadn't told them before. Here's some clips from that second round of questioning. So you and Shane got in an argument, correct? Yes. Can you describe the argument or this tussle that you had with Shane? It's over the gun. He had the gun. He wouldn't give me the gun. Oh, and the gun was a what? It was a 22. A critical carbine, a short carbine. Okay. And where did this struggle occur? In the pole building. And what was the struggle about? Just that he had the gun? He had the gun. He wasn't supposed to have the gun. He had the gun. So I tried to, you know, just ask him if he'd give me the gun. He didn't. So I, I just grabbed the gun and tried to wrestle it away from him. He was pulling the gun back a little bit. I said, Shane, just give me the gun. And he wouldn't. So we were struggling, the gun went on. Hit Shane in the throat. Shane went down. It's like I described, there was blood everywhere. So I, I didn't know what to do. I went in and told Shane. But I am. So I told him to stay in the house. So take care of Shane. So I went back out to the bowl building. Stay there for a couple of days. 
Billy could get some stuff ready. Is that what he had to do? He didn't want to do it then or anything because the girls were there. So did you send the girls away? Yeah, that week, yeah. Where'd they go? Oh, the people's houses. Friends. <laughs> Laid the material down on the ground with Pain Mary that you did the cremating of Cappy, your name's correct? Yes. So the only difference this time is you didn't have as many materials. No, I didn't. I didn't work. And you didn't use any other accelerants or anything else, you just burned. No, I didn't. And wood, I'll have wood. And you burn the, the sleeping bag with Shane in it. Yes, sir. You know, obviously police are now realizing, okay, if these crimes occurred, what is the shred of physical evidence that we're going to have left behind? That's why he's asking about the accelerants, what he used to burn the body. He, was he in the sleeping bag? Can we find any of this evidence? Because obviously this happened a while ago. So if they're going to solve this, they, they better come up with physical evidence. Mm-hmm. And it was so evident in that interview that, I mean, again, sh especially with Shane, Shane was like a son. Damn, I mean, literally taught him how to surf, and I'm sure they had a lot of, you know, in all the bad, there was probably some good memories there. And, I mean, based on just taking that for face value, it does seem like he's really torn up about. Yeah, I don't think those are crocodile tears at all. Those That seems like genuine grief. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, they got back to that property and he just confessed right there on the spot. I think he wanted to clear his conscience. So unfortunately the major problem with this case going forward was a severe lack of physical evidence. And Shelly as the master manipulator that she is, she was very good at covering her tracks. We see things like she's forging the postcards and the letters and she knows how to get rid of bodies. They've already dumped the remains out in the ocean. At one point, an unnamed friend of one of the daughters had an extended stay at the no tech house. And she actually came forward and claimed that there was nothing ever out of the ordinary at this house. That wow. Everything seemed completely fine. So That's even crazy. Witnesses who had been guests at their home couldn't really convince anyone that anything odd was going on. Plus, while investigators excavated the entire five-acre property, they realized that the remains of Shane and Kathy were basically gone. The only thing that they could find was a quarter-sized chunk of human bone that had been burned. Quarter-sized. That's tiny. But they did discover Ron's intact remains in the Notex backyard. A medical examiner determined that Ron's body showed signs of physical abuse, but it could not be determined exactly how he died. After searching the house, they still couldn't find much evidence of the murders, but they found evidence of Shelley's abuse, and this was pretty apparent. They even found a roll of undeveloped film with a picture of Kathy Loreno crawling along the floor naked, which this might have been the photograph that Shane took and threatened to show police. Still, it was going to be difficult for the prosecution to convince an entire jury of first-degree murders. They couldn't even find two of the victims' bodies, and they couldn't forensically confirm how any of the victims had died. So, they thought their best move was going forward with second-degree murder charges. But, unfortunately, the maximum sentence for second-degree was only... 22 years and to many obviously this didn't seem like enough for what had been going on inside this house so they ended up offering shelly and dave plea deals dave pled guilty to second degree murder of shane unlawful disposal of human remains and rendering criminal assistance as for shelly she accepted a rare alford plea an alford plea is basically just a guilty plea but the defendant claims innocence and doesn't admit to the criminal act but they acknowledge that there's enough evidence to convict them of a crime. This made Shelley avoid trial, and she hoped it would reduce her sentence. She eventually took the plea deal of second-degree murder of Kathy and manslaughter of Ron. 
Also, both Dave and Shelley were aware of marital privilege laws, which come into play here. So they didn't have to testify against each other. At any point, they could just claim the right to marital privilege laws and stop their spouse from taking the stand. Because imagine if they did have to take the stand against each other. It would have been a whole different story. Yeah. A lot of, oh my God, I couldn't even imagine Shelly's manipulation on the stand. Oh, yeah. She could probably convince, uh, well, I don't want to say that, but she could, I don't know. She would definitely work her convincing magic. And she'd probably try to pin it all on Dave. She'd throw him under the rug and make him take the fall for everything. Absolutely. Like, I was just trying to help everybody. Yeah. It's just crazy. I mean, that's how fooling everybody. Yeah, she had already convinced the community that she was this good-hearted person. So she probably would have used that to her advantage too. Like everybody that knew me knew me as this nice, you know, helpful person that's just trying to do good. And meanwhile, my my husband Dave, I mean, just a monster. Yep, he did all of this, and I mean, maybe it would have ended up with her, you know, receiving a lower or reduced sentence or reduced charges. So maybe it was a good thing that that didn't happen. Yeah. But Dave was only sentenced to 15 years in prison, and he was paroled in 2016 after only serving 13 years. In 2022, he filed a protective order against Shelly after realizing she might get out soon as well. While in prison, he maintained contact with Sammy and Tori, who have since said they forgive him for his actions. However, Nikki did not forgive him. She said the abuse they all endured was unforgettable and unforgivable. As for Shelly, none of her daughters have forgiven her. The judge mostly ignored the plea deal terms and Shelley still received the maximum sentence he could give of 22 years in 2004. So do the math. In 2019, with their mother's potential release on the horizon, her daughters were vocal about how they feared for the safety of others if their mother was ever released. In 2019, the book, If You Tell by Greg Olson tells the daughters firsthand accounts of what happened in detail. So if you want to check that out, We'll link that for you. But despite their best efforts to keep Shelly locked away, on November 8th, 2022, at 68 years old, Shelly was released from prison early after only serving 18 years in prison. She got out four years early. That's insane to me. And we both know why. Because she probably manipulated the hell out of everyone in prison. Look, I'm an ideal prisoner. I'm an inmate. I haven't caused any problems. Parole board, officers, everybody she came in contact with so when she was released they did say you know what you're gonna still be under court ordered supervision for at least a year and that's coming to an end here soon right yeah in two days from when we record this episode so one year yeah november 6th so november 8th it did say at least a year so it could continue longer than that but she might just be off scot-free wow that's just insane a former neighbor claimed that Shelly is currently in poor health and didn't think she had the energy anymore to victimize more people, but many people think differently. Physical abuse was only one aspect of her long streak of terror. Her emotional abuse and extreme manipulation are still possible. As for her victims, Kathy the Reno will always be remembered as a good-hearted woman who tried her very best to take the pain and suffering away from Shelly's children. Shane will always be remembered as a brother to the daughters and a hero for trying to stand up to Shelly and Dave and expose their crimes. Ron will always be remembered as a sweethearted man and despite his troubles, always found kindness in his heart when he was with Tori, but trapped in Shelly's home. And as for their daughters, Nikki, Sammy, and Tori, they have tried their very best to move on. Can't even imagine how hard it must be to deal with this. And I mean, at this point, it's just making sure that her mother's crime, their mother's crimes are never forgotten. I mean, it's, she's still out there. And in 2019, you know, they basically had to relive those experiences, relaying what it was like in that household just because they felt it necessary to tell the world what was going on. When asked what Sammy would do if she ever saw her mother again, she said, if she ever turns up on my doorstep, I can just see myself locking all my doors and barricading myself in the bathroom and then calling the police. And I don't blame her one bit. I mean, if I were her daughters, I would be, I'd want to stay as far away from Shelly as I possibly can. I mean, she is the definition of an evil genius Yeah, in a lot of ways. The fact that this went on for so long and she was able to manipulate everybody to the point that they just took her for face value. And I mean, 
good on her daughters for finding that strength once they were finally out of the house to come together and and do the right thing. I, this case may have been brushed completely under the rug if they never contacted yeah. police. I mean the the amount of strength and courage it took for them to go forward and turn their mother in and I yeah was probably one of the hardest things I ever had to do. Yeah. And thank God they did. I'm just it's just crazy to me that I don't know. I'm sure there's there's a lot of people that think they should have pursued the first degree murder charges even without the 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 bodies and additional physical evidence because I mean, you can still do it. It's definitely more difficult and I get like you don't want her to be acquitted, right? You don't right. want her to get off scot free. So maybe it was really best to pursue the second degree murder charges, but I mean, obviously I think she she should have been put away for the rest of her life and never released. And like I said earlier, manipulators who are also killers is the scariest thing to me for exactly this reason that she knew how to cover her tracks so well she knew how to manipulate every single person around her to the point that she only got second degree murder charge after all of this this is insane it is insane but we want to know your thoughts about this case because i mean there's so many that you can have and so much anger and frustration with this and i mean the poor victims in this is just it's heartbreaking to know what they went through and all the abuse and torture is just unfathomable and you know my heart goes out to kathy's family and, and all the families of the victims ron and shane and it's just to find out that that's how your loved one spent their their final days is just beyond comprehension so with that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. We'll see you guys in the next one. And until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs>